Hey, Katie. Sunday of Pentecost. Before we worship, let me go through a few announcements. We will be looking for a special music for July and August. Please contact Jennifer Butterworth if you have any suggestions. Sally will be away June 12th until beginning of July. The Adventure and Worship Team is planning a meeting Sunday, July 2nd at 6 p.m. in Westminster Hall. Today is the church picnic, the meeting following at Coldstream Dam. The pavilion on this side hill is where we'll be meeting. For those who need closer proximity to the pavilion, please contact Diane and there will be a specified vehicle to carpool you to the pavilion. The deacons will be providing paper products and water. The deacons hope to see everyone today. Vacation Bible School is fast approaching July 24th through 27th. Please consider making donation toward the purchase of snacks. If you'd like to donate, please see Jeff, Mary, Beth, Ayat, Iyad, Lisa, Holden, or Jen Butterworth. Thank you. The people's well, choice. Is an item up. There's some changes with the oh. picnic and the cold stream. Okay. Uh, we, instead of going on the side hill to that Pavilion up there. We're going to do it down the pavilion, down by the playground equipment. Down by the playground. It'll be a farther walk to go to the bathroom, but I got to the caretaker there, and we weren't allowed to drive over the grass. So we changed. I made an executive decision to go down to the, the closer pavilion. Okay, closer pavilion by the playground. Yes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. The People's Choice will be happening this summer at First Presbyterian. The People's Choice is a sermon created by Pastor Katie, but suggested by you. You only need to get a topic to Pastor Katie and she will have a sermon on Sunday, the summer, for all to hear. You can contact Pastor Katie with a favorite scripture, an idea, a person of the Bible, or whatever topic you would like to learn about more. The Light is the new service that will begin August 6, 2023, following the regular worship service in Westminster Hall. The team is still looking for a pianist, an instrumentalist, singers, computer savvy folks, gently used playground items which will be used in, in the parade ground in the back of the room for the children. The children will be welcome and unrestrained in this service. This will be a once a month service of primarily music lasting no longer than 45 minutes. We will continue as a once a month service until the worship team begins to be more comfortable. One other announcement, the lilies to the God's glory and for the grandchildren's graduation are from Jim and Ilo Ward. Justice flow down to the sea. Let just, justice flow down like a river. Let justice begin through me. Let's pray. Holy Father, we come today to worship you and to have our spiritual compass reset to do your justice in this world. Help us today to remember our role as Christians and to be inspired to live it. In Jesus' name, Amen.
knowing that God will protect us, strength and love, while we persist in falling short of God's glory, love and hope for us. Let's join together to offer God those times we need Christ's help to be the people and the church we are called to be. Let us pray together. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness. We have failed to judge us in your name. We have failed to stand for those who cannot stand and speak for those who cannot speak because of the burdens we have allowed them to bear. We have a life that is blessed so that we can make sure others experience your blessings. Create in each of us new hearts that are determined to let justice flow through our voices and in our actions and in our lives. This day and every day, in Jesus' name, Amen. And now time for personal silent confession. God promises to always execute justice. Know that God's justice includes mercy. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
First Testament reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. Hear the word of God. Simon and Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. This is the word of God. Thanks to Amen. Until we really get to know him, we can't say we know him. You know that's why we come to church, is so that we can say we know him and love him. It's also why you go to Sunday school, why you sing in the Sunshine Singers, because all those things teach you all about Jesus, so that you do know him. And you won't say, like Peter did, I don't know the man. We never want to do that if we get it all healthy. Sometimes we may feel like he's far away. But do you know where he is? Yeah. Right. That's right. You say prayer? Thank you, Lord, that you live in our heart. Help us every day to learn more about you so that we will never say that we do not know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I invite you now to hear the word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of Luke again, the 22nd chapter, this time beginning with the 54th verse. After they had arrested Jesus, they led him away and brought him to the high priest's house. Peter followed from a distance. When they lighted a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down, Peter sat among them. Then a servant woman saw him sitting in the firelight. She stared at him and said, this man was with him too. But Peter denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. A little while later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. An hour or 
so later, someone else insisted this man must have been with him because he is a Galilean too. Peter responded, man, I don't know what you are talking about. At that very moment, while he was still saying that, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter, and Peter remembered the Lord's words. Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and cried uncontrollably. The reading ends the 62nd verse of the 22nd chapter. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O loving Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our rock and our sure redeemer. Amen. Today we return to our series on finding God in the fire. During the Pentecost season so far, we have visited the flames of Pentecost, the great I am in the burning bush, and the Leviticus eternal flame that was never to go out, and Paul actually saying to Timothy, keep that flame going, fan that flame of faith always. And now today we come to a more sinister tableau. We have Peter in the firelight while Jesus is inside being questioned. Now, Jesus has been betrayed, he's been arrested, he's been taken to the home of the high priest, and that is where we find Peter, outside, kind of mingling with the crowd at the firelight, if you can picture that. Peter couldn't go in with him. He didn't really have a choice. And, you know, we have to give Peter some credit that he actually followed Jesus. But Luke is the gospel that makes it very clear that he followed from afar. Now, it makes perfect sense to us that if Jesus had just been arrested, Peter would be afraid of being arrested as well. But we don't believe that there was anything illegal about following Jesus, but Peter was still very much afraid. And yet, he comes out of the shadows, and he sits with those who are gathered around that fire for warmth. The Holy Land gets cold at night. They needed that fire in the springtime and summer. So there he is, and he's come out of the shadows, and suddenly he's in the light where people can actually see his face. So it's no surprise that one, and in this case we believe a young girl, basically says, weren't you with him? And of course, Peter angrily says he was not. He doesn't know him. We basically are getting several times where Peter is saying, I don't know the man. He didn't want to be associated with him. He was afraid of being arrested. He didn't want guilt by association with Jesus. In verse 57, he says, woman, I do not know him. And his courage that caused him to follow is beginning to fail him. The word for deny, or naomi, is used in the Old, in the New Testament as the polar opposite of the word for confess, homolopian. Now, remember, Peter's the first one to confess that Jesus is the Lord, the Son of the living God. You remember that confession. So it is totally opposite 
for Jesus to actually be denying, for Peter to actually be denying the existence or the knowledge of Jesus. It doesn't take long before another one says something. You are one of them, he says. And Peter says, man, I am not. He's getting even more aggravated. The second betrayal, the second denial, actually disowns Jesus. And you can tell that he's even in war. Peter is even in war distress by the tone of the Greek in that passage. After an interval of about an hour, a third one says, Sir, surely this man was with him, for he is a Galilean. It makes us realize that Peter's accent betrayed him. Just like we can tell when someone comes from the south or from particular areas of the country by the idioms they use, by the sound of their voice, Peter was recognized. He could not deny that he was a Galilean. And this is where he really gets mad. I do not know him. An interesting thing about this third time, and Luke is the one who really holds it out. As he is saying, I do not know him, as Peter is uttering those words, it's while that is being said that the rooster begins to crow. Here we have one of the strongest of all the disciples, and he falls into the trap that Satan set for him, just as Jesus at the Last Supper had told him he would. Now the Lord does not forget that Peter is out there, and commentators don't understand how this worked. There must have been a window, and we know there wasn't glass. But somehow or another, Jesus must have been able to see Peter and even hear what Peter said. We know that at that point, he turned, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, I like the word that Luke uses in the Greek here. Because John uses it to describe the way that Peter was looked at by Jesus when they first met. That word is in Lipo. And it signifies a look of interest or love or concern. So the way John reports the call of Peter and how Jesus looked at him is the same as how Jesus looked at him after he had denied him and the rooster had crowed. It's amazing, but the wording here actually means love and concern. Jesus wasn't looking at him with anger or hatred. Jesus was looking at him with love. And I think it's almost the fact that it's loving and caring that really gets to the heart of Peter. Because once Jesus looks at him, he goes away and he's crying uncontrollably. That is a powerful scene, a powerful moment. It says he wept bitterly. Now, one of the things we might miss in the intention that Jesus has with the rooster crowing as that last denial is spoken, is that there is always hope of a tomorrow, of a new morning. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Those Old Testament words in some way represent what's happening here. The rooster is announcing a new day. And for Peter, there will be a new day and we'll look at that with the breakfast on the beach by fire. But for now, we can realize that Jesus hasn't given up on Peter. There is more to come. There will be a new day. Now, I think if we try to figure out how that actually applies to us, 
I think we would agree that we are not always claiming Jesus as Lord and Savior. Sometimes we are very silent about our faith. I know my great aunt Connie, she was a sweetie, but she, being a lifelong Presbyterian, was very devout. And I still remember going to lunch with her at D.H. Holmes in New Orleans on Canal Street, having trout amandine, which was wonderful. But before we began to eat, I remember being surprised. My Aunt Connie, she bowed her head, and she thanked God for the food, and she asked blessings on my father and mother and on my sister and I. It was, for me, a powerful moment because I had never seen anyone pray in public for their food. I remember getting home and asking my dad, why don't you do that? And I remember him kind of passing it off. Well, she's old, and we don't do that because it's ostentatious. Like, I knew what that meant at that age, but... He was trying to tell me that they didn't want to call attention to themselves. In a real way, even something as simple as that is denying Jesus. I know when Jimmy and I first started dating 42 years ago, we agreed that we would always pray for our meals, even in public. And we've had mixed reactions over the years. Some people just kind of look away. Other people nod. Some people have come to us and asked us to pray for them with tears in their eyes. It's a powerful thing that we can do, and it's just such a little thing. But often we pass it off as either not necessary, or in my father's words, too ostentatious. And yet, Think of the price that was paid by people that have gone before us. Peter himself would die by crucifixion, head down because he said he did not deserve to be crucified the way the Savior was. We also know that of the great reformers, there were some that were martyred, there were some that were executed. And in the 20th century, we have the figure of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you've read any of his works, they are very powerful. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of the writers of the Barman Declaration, which is one of our confessions that's in our book of confessions. And you'll hear me read it at times through the year. We'll recite it instead of the Apostles' Creed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, wrote that to stand up against Hitler because he was requiring pastors to preach what he wanted them to preach and not what Jesus wanted them to preach. And for his not denying Jesus, he was hanged. So for us to have someone just look at us funny doesn't really seem to be one of those things that matters. We should still do the things that say that we're a Christian, whether it's coming to church on Sunday in spite of whatever else is scheduled, or even just praying in public or as a family. Now, there is a saying among pastors, not one that I agree with, but basically pastors will tell you that they don't believe in saying what they do because it opens them up to all kinds of things. And sometimes it's because they feel it makes others uncomfortable. I know Jim has told me many times that when he's told people that he's a pastor on the golf course, their game usually begins to suffer. Sometimes they're telling him all of their faults and sins. Other times they're telling him their woes. Other times they're attacking the Christian faith and saying what hypocrites the people are. All of those things really do happen to pastors once they have basically outed themselves as, yes, I'm a Presbyterian pastor. 
Jim and I have never felt that it was important to keep that a secret. Usually pastors keep it a secret when they can't get away. And the number one place is on an airplane. <laughs> and Jimmy and I have been on plenty of them. And you'll see sometimes people that are dressed as clergy, but most won't wear their collar on a plane for the same reasons that they might not on the golf course share that they're a pastor. They're about to hear all about the person's life or about the ways in which the church has failed them. Jimmy and I have always believed that that was another opportunity for ministry. It doesn't mean we always came out and said, hey, I'm a pastor. But it does mean that when someone asked us about it, if they noticed something we were reading, we would say, yes, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor in Phillipsburg. I pastor First Presbyterian Church. I have a wonderful church family. One trip that Jimmy and I had, we'd been out in Wyoming doing an interview, and we were headed back, and somehow or another, we got separated. His seat was a different number than mine in row. And so I got in by the window, and I was kind of disappointed because I loved sitting next to my husband. But I noticed after a few minutes that the lady next to me was crying. And I reached out and I patted her hand and I said, what's wrong? And she basically looked at me and said, you don't care, you don't want to know. And I said, no, I do want to know. I'm a pastor. I work for Jesus. Tell me what is wrong. And it was interesting because that part of the plane got silent. And I could see this, the flight attendant looking at us. And at one point I could see her praying. The lady began to unfold her story. She told me that hours before she had attempted suicide. They'd been able to save her. And she had begun to think maybe there might be hope, but she wasn't sure, and she was still deeply depressed. She was flying to Indianapolis, and her mother was meeting the plane. The rest of that flight, all the way from Wyoming to Indiana, she talked. I listened, I patted her, I dried her tears, I prayed with her. That was not what I expected to be doing on the plane. But I can tell you to deny that I was a pastor at that point would have been hard. Because somehow or another, and you know I'm a Calvinist, so this makes sense to me, but somehow or another, God put me next to her. When we got to Indianapolis, we stood up to deep plane, and she just wrapped me in a hug. And she went on her way. I actually saw her mother meet her and wrap her in her arms. And I knew she was going to be okay. And I don't remember this, but Jimmy says that the flight attendant thanked me. As if we need thanks for such things. But I want you to think today about the situations that you might find yourself in. Maybe you've already been in some situations. Were you honest about who you are? Did you share that you're a person of faith, that you're a son or daughter of the king? Were you there to listen, to care, to make a difference? The same way Jesus, looking at Peter, was trying to make a difference for him. Even in the midst of the most horrible situation, that look, not of anger, not of disowning Peter, but rather loving Peter. There's a whole world out there who needs the love that we know, the love we can give, the grace that we can share, the forgiveness that we can talk about. But if we deny knowing Jesus, even by our inaction, then in a very real way, we become like Peter. And we know that Peter did get reinstated. 
He did get commissioned to go on in ministry, and we'll look at that in a couple of weeks. But every day, we are living reminders of Jesus Christ. And it's up to us how Christ can use us in any given situation. And whether or not we'll ignore or deny that opportunity, or whether we will go forward in faith, knowing he will give us the words, he will give us everything we need to minister to someone who is in crisis. I can't pretend that I've followed this every time. I haven't. But it's definitely something we should try to do. It's not an evangelism strategy. It's about love. It's about realizing that Jesus needs us not to deny him, but to own him and to share him and to care. Whether by firelight or the blazing light of day or even the dim light of an airplane, I believe that Jesus wants us to have courage. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
This morning we are celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper by intinction. That means that you will come to the center aisles and come forward. There'll be two stations with bread and grape juice, and you'll return to your pews by the outside aisles. Intention is very special. You take a piece of bread and you dip it in the grape juice, and then you go ahead and eat it. This is not where we hold it and take it together. This is different. Intention actually means to color. And basically, when you dip this bread into the grape juice, it will turn this purple. Basically, we, as Christians, are to be immersed in Christ, that we might be changed and transformed into what we can be of Him for others. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup, and as he poured, he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed with my blood, this do you as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. That night our Lord Jesus approached the Father and presented prayers of praise and thanksgiving. We now approach the Father. Loving Father, we come before you this day. We ask that you would set apart these elements of bread and grape juice to this common use and mystery. O oh Lord, we ask that you would fill our hearts this day with your presence, and that in taking this sacrament, we too might be colored with you, that we might truly show to anyone we meet in the world, in our families, in our workplace, that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are his letters of recommendation we are living reminders of him. Lord, may we do these things and never deny him. In Jesus' name, amen.
while we are still gathered at Christ's table, we come with all of our prayer concerns. Our goss is now under hospital care and she's at Windy Hill. There's a flyer in your bulletin that is the type, the name of the second service that will be happening beginning the first Monday in August. Pray for this. Pray that it will honor God and that it will all come together. Um, we have an email this week from Jason McMillan. Jennifer Christian is now in our father's house. We need to pray for her family and her co-workers. This is an office of about, I think he told me seven people, and two of them have been in such horrible crisis. Please pray for them. Continue to pray for Joe Reed's healing and Kathy Richmond's healing. Yesterday, CJ had his first chemotherapy. If you want to follow him, there is a Facebook page and they're telling us everything. And he was ready to go home and the picture I saw him, he was doing well. So let's pray that he continues to do well. We continue to pray for all of those on the back of the bulletin and for the Logan Valley Church, Barry Vance is their moderator, and for the church in Thailand and its pastor. Now we have, yesterday I received a bunch of names that are clergy or retired clergy. Bob Hicks had a serious bicycle accident. For those of you that know him, he's at Hershey. And Joe Blunt, Chuck Curley, Bob Hoffman, all of these were also in need of our prayers. Are there any online call? No. Any others? Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. We now know that the submersible imploded we need to be praying for the families of those people and all those that are affected by their deaths. Such a tragedy. <laughs> Tomorrow, happy birthday to Todd. Up there, running sound. It's also my daughter's birthday. Yay. Anybody else? Yes. We're praying for Mary's sister. Julie Jo. Uh, keep your prayers for Bailey Lucas, uh, Ivan's boyfriend. I believe he's going to have a bone marrow uh, biopsy done. I think it's this week. Yeah. He's heading yes. back to Cleveland. So keep your prayers for our Bailey, please. You can also follow him on Facebook, on his site, or on his mom's. And most of us, that way we're praying specifically for what's happening. I know Ivy's having foot surgery on the July 6th. July 6th. On July 6th. So keep keep all of those and those that are recovering from surgery in your prayers. Let us go to God in prayer. Amen. Oh, happy birthday this week. Happy birthday this week. Colleen's ah, going to be first birthday today. We got a lot of birthdays in June. It's a good time. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh, gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for opportunities to serve you, for opportunities to represent you to others, especially those that are in crisis. Today we have named a lot of people there are even more on the back of the bulletin. All of these people need your great physician's healing touch or your comfort around them with your loving arms. There are many in our church family that are grieving 
we ask that you would hold them close to you. Lord, this day, we know that there are things happening in our world. We need your presence in each and every one of those. Find ways that we can be of love and health and grace to those that most need it that are near us. Bless the little guys that are having chemotherapy, especially CJ, and continue to bless those who are about to have surgery. And now, Lord, we thank you for this sacrament of communion, and we ask that you would hear us as we pray the way you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We ask that you would use them both within these walls and outside of these walls, that we might serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
here to remember what it is to be God's people. We are loved. We are forgiven. Let us go into the world looking for God's opportunities to help others know Jesus. And now may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, descend upon each of us and abide in our hearts, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.